Hi, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Is this on? Great. Um, so I want to talk with you all today about the potential role of whiteness in what has been called deaths of despair. I'm actually looking at um, two distinct but related mortality trends, an absolute decline in life expectancy uh, in low education whites, as well as rising midlife mortality in low education whites. The former um, is taking place in people without a high school degree, white men and women without a high school degree. The latter is happening in people, white people with high school degrees and without high school degrees. And um, I'm going to put my, the, the thinking that I'd like to do with you all today, which is in the early stages, um, in the context of a paper that I published a year ago, which was an ethical analysis. What I want to talk with you today isn't an ethical analysis. It's more conceptual and empiric in nature. And I haven't done empiric studies around this. Um, I'm just beginning to kind of lay out some conceptual thinking around this. But the context for this thinking, or what led me to this question about the potential role of whiteness or racisms in some form in being, possibly being implicated in this rising midlife mortality in low education whites, or in this absolute de decline in uh, low education whites, um, is this paper uh, that was published in a bioethics journal <clears throat> called the American Journal of Bioethics, titled the paper Shrinking Poor White Lifespan, Spans uh, Class, Race, and Health Justice. And um, it focused just on the absolute decline in life expectancy in white men and white men without a high school degree. And depending on which studies are correct, what we see is that white women without high school degrees have lost between five and three years of life expectancy. White men without high school degrees have lost between uh, six months and three years. And this graph here from a wonderful paper, if you're interested in this issue, by Isaac Sasan, um, took a look at a lot of the demographic and social epidemiological studies um, and what is highlighted there is the fact that you can see now that if you look at white women and black women without high school degrees their life expectancies have now converged roughly to around 74 years if you look at black men and white men without high school degrees their lifespans now have roughly converged to around 68 years um, that is from um, black men and women making slow but incremental gains in life expectancy and from white men and women without high school degrees falling down, if you will, the, the longevity escalator. Um, and so now you see this convergence. And the question that I asked in the paper that gave rise to the thinking I've begun to do around concepts of whiteness and their potential, is that me causing that sound? Can you guys hear that? Mm -hmm. I'll try to, maybe I need to step away from this microphone, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, the question that I posed in the, in the paper was this, and, and many thought it was excessively controversial question to ask, but I asked it anyway, <laughs> which was, does this mortality trend in low education white people constitute an injustice, or does re uh, it reflect justice being done? Um, now, um, I've been talking about this in various places and spaces with various types of people since I began thinking about it, and it is remarkable the kinds of responses that I get. Um, it is the full range. Uh, some who view that as a controversial question because of course it's an injustice, um, and those who view it as a less controversial question because, you know, if white America's in crisis, what have black Americans been going through all this time? So the paper that um, grabbed a lot of people's attention that documented the uh, absolute decline in life expectancy on low, low education whites. I mean, demographers have been tracking this for decades, but the Olshansky and <coughs> Kelly uh, paper caught a lot of attention, got a lot of press attention. Um, and when I first saw this paper, I have to tell you that my response to it was, oh, look, there's, some, I just kind of quickly tucked, this was back in 2012, 2013, I quickly tucked this into my uh, teaching and various presentations I was giving as an example of how health inequities might occur. Right, I mean, it's not just that um, health disparities occur in a whole variety of ways, but one way is that uh, more advantaged groups, socially advantaged groups, make greater gains in life expectancy and various measures of health. But here's an example, um, rare in the modern world, not unique in the modern world, where you have a socially disadvantaged group falling down the escalator of health and longevity. Um, but then, and then, of course, Case and Deaton and Case and Angus Deaton a few couple of years later in 2015 hit 
uh, the presses with uh, their document documenting uh, what came to be called deaths of despair. And this was the rising midlife mortality, uh, low education white people killing themselves largely with drugs and the beginning opioids, but how many different types of drugs are used in this. And I was just at a National Academies of Science meeting talking about this and learned from Dr. Case that in fact, the, the, it, that there, this isn't tapering off, this just continues to ratchet up this trend. Um, but the point I want to share with you is, is that as, I, um, as more and more papers documenting these two related but distinct trends, um, what we began to see in the press was this. Lots of concern, lots of attention. It just happened to coincide with the election of the Trump administration, who also gave a lot of attention to uh, those poor white people who've been left out. And so, um, this in combination with a lot of very interesting conversations with colleagues, uh, some of whom are here, led me to think that this issue could uh, merit from more systematic ethical analysis. And so I wrote the paper. And I'll just, I don't have time to go through the arg argument, of course, because I'm not here to talk to you about the ethical argument. I'm here to puzzle with you around this, these, these conceptual issues of the way in which whiteness might be implicated in these deaths. But I will tell you how I answered the question and how uh, my, my path to my conclusion led me to what I want to talk with you about today. And I hope someone's tracking my time because I am not. Okay. Uh, thank you. So I concluded that the absolute decline in life expectancy does constitute an injustice. And I did so on um, these kinds of grounds, which were societal failure to mitigate the effects of poverty and pathology on the development of children's capacities and talents, uh, cutting short uh, their fair opportunity to be and do things that people typically value, like being healthy, living a normal lifespan, and having the opportunity to develop one's potential and talents. Keep in mind, in this paper, I was focused on people whose lives were so chaotic, were in such turmoil, they weren't able to graduate from high school. So we're talking about people with 11 or fewer years of education. Um, I, of course, attended in the paper to the fact that this injustice afflicts people of all races and ethnicities, born in the research poor and troubled families who shoulder people of color, children of color, shoulder in higher rates of poverty and, and racism to boot. So racism on top on top of that. And it was in, in, in that portion of the paper where my <coughs> reflections began to think about whether diminishing white privilege or racism in some form was implicated in this lifespan contraction, right? So the absolute decline in life expectancy. And we can sort out if there are demographers in the room who understand well the relationship between rising midlife mortality and the absolute decline, and perhaps um, you can ask them that question. But my understanding is that the rising midlife mortality is making a contribution to the absolute decline in life expectancy. It does not, it does not explain it all uh, in total. It does not explain it in total. So let me just tell you what my conclusion is slightly restated in that paper, which is that the lifespan contraction in low education whites violates key normative criteria that we, are, we use to make determinations of um, health justice, health injustice, and, and, not but, but and, these judgments do not vitiate concerns about white privilege or racism being causally implicated. So we have to entertain that complexity together. Um, and so the question I wanted to um, puzzle with you all today about, and that I've been thinking about for some time, um, is how might whiteness be implicated in the um, decline in life expectancy and the rising uh, midlife mortality that's been documented in low education white people. So um, I want the next couple of slides, what they'll do is they'll, they'll present what on earth I mean by whiteness, which some of you may be very familiar with, but some of you may not be. I have discovered that as I've been talking about this a bit, people um, stop me in my tracks and ask me, what do you mean by whiteness? Do you mean having white skin? Well, sort of, but not only. So, um, <clears throat> there are ideas about whiteness as a racial category. And I, excuse me, I need to do this. <laughs> um, and, here I'm drawing on people like Cheryl Harris, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, classic Keisha, 1993. Um, whiteness is a constructed racial category where there are uh, material, psychological, cultural rewards for having white or light colored skin. Uh, uh, 
whiteness functioning as a marker of um, racial identity <coughs> associated with privileges that create uh, social differentiation and social inequality. And so whiteness is a racialized system. Okay? Whiteness is a, a racialized system founded um, on structural racism. And so here I'm quoting from Cheryl Harris. Uh, in ways so embedded uh, that it is rarely apparent, the set of assumptions, privileges, and benefits that accompany the status of being white have become a valuable asset. Um, so if you look at, at whiteness studies, um, this idea of whiteness has been complexified, or begun to be complexified. Um, that whiteness is not um, just about the color of our skin or this constructive racial category. That there's, it's also a social and a symbolic category. Um, and so on, on this idea, some scholars have begun to integrate notions of class, gender, geography, for example, and these identities that also function as axes of social differentiation and social domination that uh, interact and combine with race. So it's a much more capacious concept. It's a much more complex idea of whiteness. Um, but it still stands as this um, sort of marker of uh, cultural identity with, is this, that's associated with privileges that, again, create social differentiation and, and social inequality. So on this idea, whiteness is multifaceted, um, and it's important to underscore here, as is, I think, brought out by the case example of, of um, no education, why it's losing life um, expectancy, that not all white people benefit to the same degree from their whiteness because they're differently situated, they're differently gendered, they're uh, differently classed, <coughs> and et cetera. So, um, this, this second slide just speaks to some um, books that have been being written. Uh, they've been being written for a long time, but there's been an uptick in them. Perhaps the election had something to do with that, <coughs> the shadowing of, of the election, I don't know. But because the case study that we're looking at, we are looking at uh, working class, we're looking at low education whites, right? And, and low education white people can take a number of forms, working class, lower middle class, uh, poor um, white people. So what do we see there with working class white Michigan read studies that emphasize the white male proud laborer? Um, uh, you can also see studies that look at kind of a white rural consciousness. Um, where the perception or the conception of oneself is thought to be hardworking, practical, embedded, very embedded in place, and not going anywhere is the idea there, embedded in community. And there is some gender, um, as with this first idea of the male white worker, um, male white laborer, working class laborer, um, some studies looking at, um, you know, the women especially being uh, the, the importance of marriage and having children and being personally responsible and being dependent and being hardworking, what um, John Williams has called settled living. When you uh, look at poor whiteness, um, if you haven't read Nancy Eisenberg's 400 plus, 400 plus page book uh, on poor white people, it's uh, a long and, and worthy read. Um, but there are other scholars who've been looking at this. Poor white people have been depicted as immoral, lazy, criminal, not quite white. The implication that to be white means you're not those things, right? Mm -hmm. uh, long history of despising, <coughs> stigmatizing, labeling poor white people. Some labels still, remarkably, in quite common use of the language of white trash uh, is kicked around with um, uh, ease. Um, and um, other histories showing um, that people of all colors have down on poor whites. So I have <coughs> some citations down there. Probably not all of them that actually have been drawn on. So, okay. So, with those ideas of whiteness in mind, um, how might whiteness be implicated in, um, in this absolute decline in life expectancy in rising the life mortality? So I'm going to, I have a lot of detailed slides that I'm going to, before I show you very quickly, because there's only five minutes left, I'm going to just think big with you guys, and then we can drill down if there's time or we can do it in question and answer. But you know, so um, perhaps it's obvious to you all, but if white privilege, so think of white privilege founded on structural racism, secures for low education whites a toehold or a foothold in the economic
um, through, for example, unions that disproportionately protected white men, right, over colored people of color, black and brown men and women, um, then when those protections are um, when those protections go away or when those protections begin to crumble or reduce, low education whites now are now exposed to material deprivation, so socioeconomic deprivation in various forms. When white privilege, again founded on structural racism, uh, secures for low education whites a, um, a sort of place in the uh, psychosocial order, uh, perhaps feelings of superiority based on their whiteness, um, then when the world changes in laudable ways, when we become, um, when we promote diversity and multiculturalism, when we see people of color in positions of authority and high governmental position, then what that might do, again, I'm just thinking out loud, um, then, then uh, what might, the trail, the causal trail might be that there is a reduction, a loss in one sense of status and place in the world. Um, you could think about this also through uh, changes in the political world, right? So to the extent that white privilege, founded on um, structural racism, uh, sort of protected white workers, I don't know, say through, um, through uh, certain worker protections, uh, like uh, unemployment insurance, or uh, pensions, or whatever, whatever they might be, and when that political order changes, when neoliberalism comes in with its austerity measures and chips away at uh, those protections, simultaneously with a political order that is doing a lot of things like creating more racial diversity and multiculturalism, then um, you might imagine ways in which whiteness might be implicated in this absolute decline in life expectancy and rising midlife mortality in that people um, are no longer protected the way they once were, and they're exposed to things that they once that they have not been accustomed to being um, exposed to. And this slide basically kind of plays out with um, in greater detail what I just talked about. But the, the thing that I want to end on, because I think I probably have one minute left, mm -hmm. is that um, there's also this issue of trying to make sense of how do we make sense of how do how might um, white people in these situations make sense of negative events and adversity. And I just want to point out um, two ways. So thinking about attributions of responsibility for negative events, that blame might be externalized. Um, that blame might be internalized. That blame might be externalized in ways that we know harm health. We know that anger and prejudice expressed for racial minorities, um, taking my jobs, lowering wages, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We know that racism at that level is there's there's data to show that that kind of stuff, um, that those kinds of narratives harm health. Uh, the victim narrative, um, that there was this better racial past um, that's been disrupted by racial minorities associated with, is also associated with poor health. Um, and we know that there's data showing that at the individual <coughs> level and at the community level, racism um, harms human health, as does cynicism and hostility um, as well. Um, we can also imagine that um, that the blame might be internalized, particularly um, if uh, this demographic has um, no other structural explanation. If, in other words, class as a system of oppression is so sort of suppressed that um, the, um, the only one to blame is oneself, because there, there might not be the consciousness that, that there's a class system in place that is at work. Um, and, and so the last thing I want to note here is um, also a contrast between white and people of, white people and people of color. Um, attributions of positive meaning for negative events and adversity. White people are, uh, there's some evidence that suggests that white people are far less likely to invoke a redemption narrative, right? To assign positive meaning when bad things happen to us. Uh, which is much more common yeah, among people uh, of color. So I have other slides that talk about other things. I'm going to just point to this one thing. I know I'm pressing my luck, Serena. Um, but you know, if you think about just the opioid epidemic part of this, 
people coming, going to the doctor. <coughs> How is it that wh white people got strung out on addicted to drugs? Well, because they're white and they had access to drugs, and we know that um, there are well documented racial disparities in pain management practices, prescribing practices. And so one of the ways, I mean, just one of the more obvious ways in which whiteness and white privilege might be implicated in, in these deaths of despair, just the focus on rising the blood mortality, is that um, when they went to the doctor and said they were in chronic pain, they were handed opiates. Um, and finally, I'm just going to show you, I'm going to skip over that slide because there's no time. Here's actually my attempt at a conceptual scheme. I just saw some people's faces. What is that? That is my attempt to draw what I've been describing. And it begins at the beginning and ends at the end. <laughs> and I will end also myself. <laughs> So um, in my research, I've tried to study the, the concept of precarious employment and health. Yeah. And a lot of the literature is sort of framed in this way of a high watermark of labor relations in the post-World War II era. And now that social contract between employers and employees has degraded over time. And I think that obviously that would have population health implications. But it didn't take too long before folks said, well, that high watermark was really exclusionary, mainly to... It was an exception. Right, right, exactly. And it was mostly white males that benefited from that, you know, <coughs> constellation of, of labor protections. So I, I heard a lot about, like, labor and employment relations in what you said, but I didn't hear the phrase kind of sense of loss. And I think that that framing of deservingness and... You know, my dad just graduated high school and, and got a job at a, a plant and had a middle class white picket fence life, and I don't have that opportunity because of, I don't know, China or something. So I, I'm just thinking about this sense of loss in the economic order that you kind of, um, uh, and there's literatures on like precarious employment and China shock and that kind of stuff that have disproportionately impacted if you think of where they started from people. Yeah, so I would just make two comments, if I may. Um, the first of which is, um, <clears throat> so this high watermark being uh, not the norm at all, but a, an aberrant, uh, an anomaly, if you will, that not just protected white men, but protected the white women they married and the children they reared, right? So if I had um, <coughs> done a better job of preparing this talk and had a, a, a reasonable number of slides, uh, I would have been able to talk you through it all a bit better. But in the causal story that's painted, and the, the ethics paper that I showed you, the AJOP paper, kind of is, v is very tethered to the, what we're understanding about an unfolding the, the causal stories that are kind of being figured out. Um, I, I speak to that. The other, the other thing I would say is sense of loss is also baked into this, and um, it's, it's, in, it's in the slides because it's not just... Uh, um, the material shocks, if you will, the, the material experiences, those material experiences need to be, those material and psychosocial experiences need to be made sense of, right? Um, and you might imagine a variety of ways in which one might make sense of them, some expressing themselves externally in, in racist forms, some being internalized in terms of self-blame, um, but they both can um, lead to a sense of loss or if we might imagine, and this was another slide I wasn't able to get to, if you can imagine, and I, I just can't find the studies, so if there are studies out there, but if, 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 I mean, there's a really terrific paper that this relies on to some degree, written by Jennifer Mallett and two other colleagues, the senior author of whom is David Williams, that um, sets out a, a conceptual map of um, a framework for thinking about the effect of whiteness on the health of whites. And uh, what's the big gap, as, and, and I've been talking with them about this, the gap in that conceptual framework is they talk always about status loss, but they don't talk about 
are the white people who are born poor and stay poor. And so the question there is, what impact does that have? I mean, we can look at epigenetic studies and all sorts of things to see what sort of direct effects that might have on health. But what effect does that have on narratives and beliefs? In other words, are there still the same expectations um, that maybe earlier generations thought? And if you look at Ann Case's data, Case and Deaton's data in the birth cohorts where things get really dicey, these are likely, if I'm reading the data correctly and the demography correctly and the epidemiology correctly, these are people who were born poor. Uh, there's, there's some data to suggest, especially given the serious um, hit that poor white women have taken, white women without high school degrees, um, that uh, they were born in very troubled, very chaotic families. Um, so anyway, that's probably more. I, I don't even know if I'm responding to you at this point. I'm just <laughs> flattering. But thank you for your comments. Thank you so much, Erica. Um, so I'm going to ask a question which sounds like a challenge, but it's not meant that way at all. It's for clarification. Um, but why do we need uh, to know more about whiteness? Um, and just to give you a little bit more background, um, if we think about the injustice that's going on um, as to what we kind of the focus of the, the different kinds of studies and the, and the, and the different kinds of um, uh, health issues that you're talking about, the injustice is about class, I take it, more than anything else. Um, so that just makes me think, so it, it doesn't make me think that whiteness is not relevant. I, I think a lot of the examples you gave us really show us um, that there is a, a very interesting aspect um, associated with whiteness. But I was wondering if you could just elaborate on that and clarify as to why whiteness is so important here. I love that question because I, like you, Karina, had thought about this issue entirely in terms of class until I was challenged by colleagues who are scholars of whiteness, and in particular, scholars of poor whiteness. And I'll just say, because I think in this venue we do this all the time, I've heard others do it and talk about their own story. I am a first generation high school graduate. So I was reared in a toxic brew of violence, domestic violence and substance abuse and all sorts of things. But I had, I'd always thought about these issues in terms of class, not about, I was like, what does race have to do with this? And in, as, so by talking with colleagues who, who said, no, you've got you've to also think about this problem in terms of whiteness. And then that, of course, led me to, you know, how we all have these giant packs of stacks of books on our, on our desks. <laughs> I began systematically wake, making my way through it and thinking, wow, well, whiteness, okay. And it, it is a bit of a, it is a bit of a, um, it, it's like a, it, it's a new frame of mind that has taken a while for me to comfortably situate on my head. So why, so why do I think at this point that at the very least whiteness um, needs to be considered in addition to class, right? And I think that has to do with, um, this won't be a very satisfying answer, it's not even satisfying to myself, um, is that um, when we think about poor white people or working class white people, we're not just talking about, about white. There's meaning associated with being situated there that also has to do with, um, with whiteness. And I, I, I don't pretend to have it figured out. And, and I am <coughs> desperately reading as many studies, both kind of personal, oh, sorry, personal narratives and more systematic sort of studies to try to understand this better my, myself. But I, I want to tell you, I think we need more. Dare I say this in this room? I think more people, we need, I need to understand this better. I think we need more studies. You always ask me really good questions, and I'm always uh, dissatisfied with my response to your questions. Yeah. Yes, I think I see. I don't, I don't know if I'm doing this. Oh, I think you, you were, I think you were first, though. India. Well, I was just going to say, I feel like um, there's some aspects, cultural aspects to whiteness I didn't see in your definitions of whiteness. And so I remember doing this exercise in this institutionalized racism training where we talk about what whiteness is. And a lot of it comes down to individualism and meritocracy. And um, I wonder if that's somewhat behind that last bullet you had about 
people of color not finding as much meaning in negative I mean, white people not finding as much meaning in negative experiences is because of this um, idea of meritocracy, and that so somehow it's, it's unearned. You know, if something bad happens to me, it was supposed to happen to me because I didn't right. do, and so do enough to. I, I appreciate that, and let me just underscore it is, it is in here. Actually, it's one of the things that I uh, personally, as a scholar, am really interested in, in exploring more, which is, um, and I'm on this slide because this slide speaks to the possibility of, and it doesn't say individualism, but um, this idea that we, that white people have absorbed, been effectively indoctrinated in this in this individualistic merit, yeah. meritocratic way of thinking about things, this frame of mind, and thus when things go awry, it is other individuals, black and brown individuals, or it is me that is to blame, rather than going, wait a minute, um, I'm living in an oppressive classist system, you know, run by ten rich people. You know, th th that there's no, and it might be shocking to imagine that one might not have available to them structural explanations for your circumstances, but I can assure you, both on studies done and anecdotal and lived experience, there are plenty of poor white people who don't have that consciousness, they, they do not have that raised consciousness. So I, I think it's a, a vitally important um, point. The individualism, yeah, the those, meritocracy. Those last two bullets that are related. <coughs> yes, yes, definitely. Yeah. So when things go bad, or when things start out bad and stay bad, this, this gap in this conceptual framework that I think needs to be examined, um, you know, the idea that there's something out there beyond you or other individuals uh, is, is uh, I think, uh, maybe a, a key. Point. I'm okay. We're out of time. So sorry, if you have more questions, perhaps during the, the coffee break. Thank you very much, Eric.